Thanks for joining us for the interview of the 2022 candidates for the Asheville City Council. I'm Kit Kramer, President and CEO of the Asheville Chamber, and I'm joined by one of our great public policy volunteers, Greg Burnett of First Citizens Bank. This interview will be with Maggie Ullman. All interviews will be posted at the Chamber's website at ashevillechamber.org slash 2022 elections. Maggie, thank you for joining us. I'm going to jump right into the first question. By 2040, our metropolitan statistical area is expected to have added almost 100,000 people. What do you think is the top priority for how the city will manage that growth? Fantastic. I'm thrilled that you start with that because that's very top of mind for me. Um, and it signals that the chamber is thinking big picture and long term so that we figure out the interim strategies that help build towards big change and transformation in the community. Um, <clears throat> I think the way we grow and specifically how we house people and where they're housed is the most pressing thing for there to be partnerships across organizations like the city and the county and the chamber and other community leaders. Okay, great. What do you think the role of economic development is in playing into that vision? Into housing. I think that, um, what would I say? Into growth on the whole. Yeah, into growth on the whole, I think that we need to have jobs that are paying higher than living wages. I think that we um, see this intersectionality, this, this cross section where folks want to be here. Uh, they aren't earning wages that are competing with the price of the housing. We also don't have enough housing. So the price of the housing is going up and up. And so we're kind of in like a negative feedback loop where the lower wages and, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that, I guess I'll say. Um, and so I think that the work the chamber and other partners have been doing to grow jobs, grow jobs that have higher wages is really, really critical. Um, and I also think that there's probably a role in economic development for advocacy on these long-term goals, because I think that looking long-term is um, not all advocates focus in that direction. And I think it's really important. Otherwise, we're going to continue into a a challenging spiral. So Maggie, how do you balance policies like increasing density uh, in certain corridors as a way to accommodate housing uh, with neighbors who may not be comfortable with growth or change? With compassion, and you do that with open ears, and you do that with vision at the same time. We have seen, um, community-led planning processes <clears throat> like our comprehensive plan that the city adopted in 2018, like the comprehensive planning process that the county is going through right now. And we have said over and over that we want to see housing near jobs with access to good transportation services. So we need to remember that. And as we pursue growth and housing growth, we need to remember the context of the community we can't put a 15 story building next to three single family units. That, that, that doesn't um, integrate effectively. And so looking towards things like accessory dwelling units at duplexes and quads, um, missing middle is kind of how planning nerds talk about it a lot where there's like big high rises and then single family lots and there's a lot in between. That in between style of housing matches our community's character at this point. So that's the type of things that we want to be looking at incentivizing. Specifically, I want to drill into the point you brought up, Greg, of that community conversation. Um, without going into the real detail of um, planning process and UDO law, which I know and I can go very deep on, which I think is very important of an elected official, we have a very brief process that community members and builders are often extremely dissatisfied with. And so we need to look at a process that doesn't leave everybody frustrated so that the process can support the vision of the outcomes that we're looking towards like density on transit corridors. So I would definitely be open to that process. Um, again, while holding that vision that if we don't 
look towards putting jobs or putting housing near jobs, we are going to continue to have sprawling growth in our community, which creates longer commute times, which creates really income disparities across our region. That's not the type of way that we need to grow. So holding that vision on corridor development for housing is very important. I hate these interviews because I want to be like, what do you think? And I want to get into dialogue, <laughs> but I know that's not the purpose of these, but I would love to like listen and, and hear what, what your ideas are another time. <laughs> well, good. We can do that at some point. So Maggie, what do you think the role of the business community is in our city? Um, as a business owner, uh, I run a consulting firm, um, small, uh, and I work with nonprofits to get them to row in the same direction on climate change, but I do that from a private sector role. Um, that I think gives me a lens into that role of the business in our community. Also the daughter of a third generation business old owner. My father took the reins from his father who took the reins from his grandfather. So being an entrepreneur is also part of who I am. Um, I think that, you know, for lack of a better metaphor, we have an, we have a car, our community is a car, there is an engine and our businesses are the gas that we put in the tank, or maybe for a better climate friendly, it's the electricity we fuel our electric cars with. <laughs> um, I think that not only are businesses propelling our economy, but they're, they're our friends. There are peers, there are bosses, there are employers. So many folks that I know that graduated from UNCA like I did found the Asheville way was to hustle and start a business to figure out how to be in this community. And um, I think that we need to figure out how, what support to, for, for people to thrive and, and hire other people look like. So Maggie, this is a two part question. So the first part is in general, where do you get your information as to mm -hmm. what's happening within our community? Mm -hmm. And then if you become a member of council, what will you do to reach out to the business community uh, to give them a voice? Just writing a note so I can stay on track. <laughs> um, so where do I get my information? Um, What I've decided to do as I started this campaign, when I decided that I would run, that was informed by having interviewed over 100 Ash villains before I even made a call. I talked to a lot of people to hear what they cared about, what they worried about, and tried to hear what was missing and if the things that I bring to the table would fill any gaps. And after talking to many people in the community, I decided that I do have something to offer. Um, I have many things. Um, I also have decided as a, a, as a candidate that I keep, I read the paper, I watch the news, I do keep a track on social media because sometimes the late, the quickest stories hit on social media, but I know that that can be really misleading. If you only read certain media sources, you would think that our community is very far apart on what we think. So I decided and then committed to knocking on a thousand doors. I've already knocked on 332. <laughs> um, and what I hear when I'm out on door, when I'm out door knocking is that Asheville is aware of the gray and the complexities of things. And so that type of boots on the ground work is really how I learn and listen the best. And I talk about door knocking, which is ultimately to residents, but I also have been attending dozens of community meetings and participating in events that awesome organizations like the chamber are hosting. So that again, I'm having learning through relationship as far and I'm a member of the chamber. Um, and so that gives me the opportunity to find other peers to learn and connect with. As far as how to reach out to the business community, I think that there's many organizations like, like the chamber, like um, Mountain BizWorks, like others um, that convene the business community. And so making sure that I'm in relationship with those folks, the leaders of those groups and understand that I can call or text and, and vice versa is the way to learn and listen. Great. So what's your stance on the issues that are affecting businesses downtown, such as camping and PAM handling? Mm -hmm. um, so this has been a challenge that Asheville's had for a long time. I remember when I got here in 2002, there were 
little change boxes out. Can you spare some change? And that was a campaign that was run to encourage folks not to hand out money to panhandlers. So this is um, a new day on an old challenge. Um, and it feels different lately. I think that the context of camping, of the unhoused, of panhandling, we need to start with the context before we start solving problems. The context is that two years ago, the bottom fell out for most of the planet. And the people close to that bottom, they fell in that hole. We also have an opioid crisis. We also have failing mental health systems and healthcare systems. And so I think that we need to start with compassion and remember that anybody on that, that's unhoused is someone's daughter, is someone's son, is is someone. And the challenges that we're seeing from folks in camping areas and folks who are panhandling is starting to create challenges for other community members. And that's not acceptable. I don't believe that um, being unhoused is a crime. I don't think being poor is a crime. Trespassing is though. Mm -hmm. And indecent exposure is and so we need to hold those accountable when crimes are committed. The other thing specifically on panhandling, I'm gathering an understanding having talked to the DA and other candidates that um, a lot of the folks in the panhandling situation are kind of pawns in a larger crime conversation where larger folk, um, organized crime around drugs are kind of offering rides to these folks to be out on corners and covering all the corners. And then those folks who make any money from panhandling, bring them back to, um, to an organized crime ring. And so we need to be really looking at how we're supporting our police force that's looking at organized crime so that we are targeting the puppeteers and not punishing the folks who are out of any option that take a really crummy choice like actual panhandling. And so that we're really getting to the root of those problems. So Maggie, what do you consider to be city council's role in maintaining public safety overall? Ooh, I love that question. It's important to understand the role. You know, when you take a job, you look at that job description and say, do I want to do this? And I want to lead on the things that are really squarely in city council's purview. When it comes to public safety, the main role that the city is chartered with is law enforcement. The city doesn't run the jail. The city doesn't run the courts. The city doesn't currently run public health, right? But I think public health is part of public safety. And so the city needs to make sure that we're doing our job well of law enforcement. But I think that we're getting to a point that when our city was chartered and we were given that role, the world has gotten much more complicated. And a lot of systems have started to fail and result in people falling through those gaps and landing on our sidewalks and causing distress and challenge for a lot of community members. So the city needs to be looking at those partnerships, especially to address the unhoused, for example, um, the partnerships that support better public health services, better mental health services, while ensuring that we aren't failing at our job role, which is the law enforcement part of it. Maggie, the most recent version of the Bowen report says that we need more housing at every income level. Yes. How can city council promote more construction of housing? Yeah. I mean, anyone watching this video, you need to go look at the Bowen report. Even if you're not a super nerd on planning stuff like we are, <laughs> it, it's essential because I think that we don't really realize how there's a domino effect. We need 4,000 more units of housing to meet demand. When we talk about the skyrocketing price of housing, we do not have enough. So Kit, what you're bringing up is that given that dramatic lack of housing, how can we get more? I think that there's some existing tools in the city's toolbox around, um, actually, let me back up a little bit further. The other thing I wanna say is that if we pursued those 4,000 units just with public money, we'd need something like $100 million a year. The last bond that we had was 25 million. So I underscore that, that this cannot be solved by the public sector alone. It's just not um, a scale of resources that our community has ever seen. So the city needs to use their role in 
regulating and planning development to really figure out how we as a community can reach these goals through these partners, through the private sector as well. So that's big context. I think your question was more focused. So let me drill down one more layer, but you'll see, I always start with the context because we can't solve a problem together if we don't understand what the main drivers of the problem are. Okay, so incentives, we currently have for large scale projects, I think the number is maybe over 20. And we look at um, tax breaks, it's called the Luigi, the Land Use Incentive Grant. We need to tweak that. We need to always be tweaking our incentive tools, but I think that we need to update that a little bit. I think that we also need to be really looking at new incentives that specifically target that missing middle we talked about earlier, where um, uh, where we're looking at units that are smaller than 18, the infill development, because the bottom line, we don't have a ton of land left over in this town. We're landlocked as a city. And so the size, the places we have to build are smaller. So we need to be looking at incentives for those smaller places as well. The last thing I'll say is that um, where this development happens really matters. Like we were talking about earlier, this development needs to be happening along corridors where we already have transit service, where we already have sidewalks, where we're really the infrastructure is matching the growth. And that um, has some room for improvement, I think. All right, Maggie, in one minute or less, <laughs> Bless you. What, what sets you apart as a candidate? My experience, hands down. I already worked in City Hall for seven years. When I was Asheville's first sustainability director, I was actually the first sustainability director in the South. So when I showed up, I had to figure out how to get a budget, how to create plans. I took a zero budget office to a million dollar annual budget within very short amount of time. And I did that through energy savings. I also increased recycling 35% in the time I was in city hall. So I don't just theoretically believe in things that we should pursue as leaders. I have the direct experience wading through the complex detail to get stuff done. And I don't know that any other candidate can say that. Well, Maggie, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, just as a reminder, you can find interviews of other candidates at ashevillechamber.org 2022 elections. And please be sure to vote on Tuesday, May 17th in the primary. So again, thank you, Maggie. Thanks for being involved. Thanks for hosting. So great to be here.